God the Father by Valerie Windsor, with Amanda Murray as B and Anthony Newlands as the Reverend Hart. April the 20th, 1910. Got up, had breakfast, rained all morning, nothing happened, went to bed. 1910. I remember writing that such a long time ago. Hmm. Such an absurd attempt to pin my life down on paper, as if I... Uh, to prove that but there was nothing to pin. At 16, one always supposes that life is going to be so momentous. April the 21st, got up, mended Edward's grey stockings. He goes up to Oxford for the Trinity term next week. It ought to be down if you start from Derbyshire. Cold mutton, baked potatoes and rice pudding. Sitting on the Walked steps the outside the dining room window the of the vicarage. Played 1910. That was the year that... Oh, so many terrible things happening. But I... I sat and wrote my diary. As if... I remember... April the 22nd, 1910. Rained again. Annie made Flo and me do the junket. It was watery. Bed. April the 23rd. A fine day. I sat on the steps and wrote up my diary in a new exercise book. Could only remember two days back. It's all got up and went to bed. Nothing much happens in between. Went for a walk to the river. Edward and Flo smoked. Ivo and I looked for fish. There's one bee, look. Catch him. You're not concentrating. Shh. There. In the pool. Near the bridge. It's huge. It's a trout. Where? There in the deep bit. Shh. I did. Here comes another. What shall I hit this time? I nearly had him then. Leave him alone. Don't tease him. I'm going to try and hit that white boulder. Bitch! You hit his leg. You did it on purpose. Of course I didn't. Come here. Let me see whether you've hurt yourself. I haven't hurt myself. You hurt me. Let me see. He's bleeding, Flo. It's pouring blood. You have hurt him. Well, I didn't mean to. Of course I shall tell Father. Oh, no, you will not. Lend me your hanky, Edward. Um. <clears throat> Ow! Oh, dear. Did that hurt? It's too tight. Of course it's too tight. It's a tourniquet. Surely you know what a tourniquet is. The extent of your ignorance appalls me. It's too tight, Ivo, dear. Dear, silly little Ivo, in order to prevent you from losing any more blood. I should hate you to bleed to death on my account. Stop teasing him, Flo. Loosen the thing off. A joke's a joke. So it is. A joke is a joke. You're absolutely right. How very perceptive you've become. Such are the benefits of an Oxford education. What a silly fuss about nothing. It's only a graze. Shut your mouth, Bee. You look like a fish. Flo! It's getting cold. Well, what shall we do, then? Shall we go home? No. I know. Let's go up to the manor and see if the Cardales have arrived yet. Hazelwick Manor. Always windy up there. Hideous old house. Oh! Can't stand up straight. The wind will blow us away. Very healthy. Good for the lungs. The gate's locked. And all the shutters are drawn. What? They haven't come. It would seem not. If I were Lady Cardale, I'd sell this monstrosity and spend all my time in London. I should live a very grand life in London. Is that your ambition? Ambition? I don't have ambitions. What a waste. Well, since they're not here, I shall explore. B, B, do you dare go right up to the house and look in at the windows? 
do you be? Shall we? Uh, I don't know. Oh, I'd love to have a look round the back. Oh, please. It, it's trespassing. Of course it isn't trespassing. We're friends of the family. I'm certainly a friend of the family. I'll come. I'm not scared. Then you've no imagination. I have. Oh, very well. I suppose you'll have to do. Ivor and I are going. You two can wait for us here. Don't be long. I shall be as long as it takes. Come on, Ivor. Look, I think there's a sort of gap in the wall here. Oh. Oh, this is peaceful. Flo doesn't change, does she? She's always so uncomfortably full of energy. What does she do with it all? Nothing. Oh, God. If it were not for the prospect of collections at the beginning of term, I should be very glad to be going back up. I think in the summer back, I shall join a reading party. And, and not come home at all? Oh, yes, for a week or so. To see you, if I can bear it. I should like... Hmm? What? Oh, to be able to say, I think I shall do this, or, or go there, or I might do that, or not. There's nothing stopping you. Flo might go to London soon. How on earth is she going to manage that? She writes to Sylvia Cardale. They've been corresponding since Christmas. Sylvia wants Flo to go and stay with them in London for the summer. The idea is that Lady Cardale will ask Father's permission to take Flo back with them. <laughs> I don't suppose for a moment that he'll agree. Although considerations of class may sway him, he may be too flattered to refuse. Will you be lonely if she goes? Of course you will. Yes. But there's always school. I like school. <laughs> so you do. I came next to top in the examinations. Phyllis Bartlett beat me by three marks. She is very good at maths and advanced botany. At advanced botany? Good heavens, what a formidable young lady Miss Bartlett must be. At maths and advanced botany. When you were older, perhaps you could come to Oxford. I should like that. I, I think I should like to read history. But you have to be very clever to win a scholarship. Phyllis Bartlett's cousin won a scholarship to Newnham. I meant that you might like to come to the May Ball. Oh. Perhaps my last May Ball. I'm not very good at, at dancing. I, I trip over my own legs. <laughs> Poor bee. Well, never mind. You'll soon grow out of that. Out of what? You wouldn't really like to be one of these female undergraduates. Everybody laughs at them. They're very dull girls, very serious-minded and earnest. No fun at all. Some of the chaps boycott lectures because of them. The dons despise them too. They all wear spectacles and boots and dreadfully mannish clothes. Well, I couldn't go anyway. You can't do anything if you've known money. Money is what binds us. Or the lack of it. If I had money, I should set up as a gentleman farmer. I'm not really cut out for the professions, B. I've not got the brain. But I'd make a damn good farmer. Oh. Oh. We ran all the way back. I've torn my skirt on something. Oh, B, you should have come. It was terrifying. All those monstrous shapes lurking under white dust sheets. Flo said one of them moved. But it didn't move. It was a sofa. You could see it was a sofa. I was trying to frighten you, you horrible, literal-minded little boy. You are late. It's only five past four. Therefore, you are late. Tea is at four o'clock. I require it to be at four o'clock, and I require you to be present. Yes, Father. It is surely little enough to ask of you. You may pour, Florence. Yes, Father. Well, I trust you all had a pleasant afternoon. Yes, we did. Very pleasant. We went now, up... come along, Beatrice. Help your sister. Pass that one to Ivor. Well, let me hear what you've all been doing. How have you been spending your time? We went down to the river. The river? Beatrice, your fingernails are filthy. You wash your hands. Put the plate down. Well? I... Since you appear to have nothing to say in your own defence, perhaps you would be kind enough to close your mouth. Go and wash, Beatrice. Wash yourself thoroughly. I'm not a clean child. April the 24th, Sunday. Got up early and went to communion. Matins. Edward played the organ. 
Ivo took his best snail to race along choir stall during sermon, one tuppence because one of the tenors trod on Harold Preston's snail. Oh, most gracious Lord, Holy Father, have mercy upon me, for I am unclean. Get up, V. Father will think you've been seduced by Rome. He looks vulgar. Father, processing alone down the aisle, past the pillar. Brass plate there now. Edward Arthur Hardy, 1891-1916. Killed in action. Dearly beloved, let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. Wake up, B. It's our turn now. You go first. <coughs> Lord, I am not worthy to come to this thy table. <coughs> Hold out your hands for the wafer. He's coming nearer. I can see his boots, size nine. The great crucified Christ with his hangdog, martyred face stares down at me from the east window. I can feel his eyes. And now I'm eating Christ's flesh, which was given for me. And it sticks dry, tasteless to the roof of my mouth. I'm making awful faces. It, it's stuck. Oh, God. His eyes upon me. He's coming back kicking his surplice with his polished boots. What have I to do with God or he with me? Now I open my mouth and fill it with Christ's blood. Did you get a good swig, B? I did. A claret, I thought. When I'm rich and famous, I shall... Huh. Oh, I shall be one or the other. Believe me, either my pet, and with luck I shall be both. You'll have to pump harder, B. There's still no water in the tap. Is that enough, Flo? Yes. Oh, I hate Sundays. It's all church. Now then, you girls. You finished them potatoes yet? As a matter of fact, we've hardly started them, Annie. Well, you hurry up, then. Come on, Miss B. You'll have to do something about yourself before morning service. Why is it always us? Why can't Edward peel the potatoes for a change? He's not entirely useless. I could do them. You are entirely useless. Oh, yeah, that's enough of that, Miss Flo. The day a man in any house I have the running off peels a potato, that's the day I go down the pit. But it's not fair, Annie. Neither's a blackamoor. You can put them on to boil when you've done. Really? Father's coming. I can't hear him. Listen, he's coming down the hall. You are strange, Bee. I'm sure you must flinch every time he turns over in bed. Good morning, Florence. Good morning, Father. Beatrice. Morning, Ivo. Beatrice. Beatrice, what are you doing? You have soaked the front of your dress. You must try to be less clumsy. I must speak to your headmistress. Perhaps a course in new rhythmical dance or some Swedish exercises. Very well, then go and tidy yourself at church. Yes, Father. And... Glad to see you engaged in such useful work, Florence. Peeling potatoes. You must all eat. But tell me, have you observed whether or not your sister always remembers to use soap when she washes? Of course she does. Hmm. Sometimes, Florence, I am forced to the conclusion that the church is too liberal in its dealings. I am with St. Paul in this matter. You should read his letters. The blessed sacrament is not to be taken lightly. She was pulling the most appalling faces. Who was? Beatrice, and her hat was crooked. Look, B, the Cardales have arrived. Shh. Look, in the Cardale pew. Sylvia's there, and Basil. Oh, God, please let it be all right about London. Look at Sylvia's hair, B. 
Turn around! She's got her hair off. It's all frizzy. Father's looking at us. Basil really is awfully good looking, don't you think? Yes. What? Yes. Oh. I wonder if Lady Carding will ask Father about London today. But her short hair would suit me. You can do that sort of thing in London. My text this morning... My text this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 29. For unto you is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to be him, but Father's also hands. to suffer yes. for his sake. Very soft and white. Not only to be on him, I was imagining him, nails hammered into them. But also to what? suffer Shh. for his sake. Let us consider very carefully this morning, then, what it means to be one of those. My dear Florence, how perfectly charming you look. Mm. And Beatrice, too. You grow more and more like your poor dear mother. Of course, you won't remember her, will you? Now, you must all come and visit us as soon as you may. I want to have that very special word with your father, Florence. Thank you very much. Not at all, my dear. We're looking forward to having you. Henry? Yes, dear? Henry, they must come to tea. We must send the motor for them. Huh? Oh, oh, yes, dear. Let me see. What about Tuesday? That'd be lovely. Splendid. And how's your poor dear father? Most interesting sermon, we thought, didn't we, Henry? Huh? Oh, yes, yes. Ah, oh, good morning, Sir Henry. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Lady Mary. Do morning. forgive me. May I say what a pleasure it is to see you again. Thank you. Well, now, good hunting this season, Vicar? Henry, the Reverend Hardy does not hunt. Doesn't hunt? Oh. Now, is everybody ready, Henry? Sylvia? Yes, Mother. Basil? Where's Basil? He and Edward went on ahead. Well, then, my dear vicar, perhaps you would escort me to the motor. We are so hoping I that you... I do like your hair, Sylvia. Do Tuesday. you? Oh, awfully. It's very practical, of course. Yes. Long hair would be such a dreadful bind in prison, don't you think? You got my last letter? Yes. We'll talk about it on Tuesday. Has, has Christabel Pankhurst got short hair? No. Well, now, young Beatrice, will you take my arm? You and I seem to be bringing up the rear, huh? <laughs> My word. You are a tall girl. Take after your father, what, huh? Yes. Fond of hunting, no? No. We don't... We haven't... Oh, no. Of course not, said of me. No stables. Pity. Tall girl like you. We're still in the schoolroom, what? Yes. Uh, no, I, I, I go to a day school near Dogthorpe. Oh, jolly good. You should tell me all about it on uh... Tuesday, Henry. April the 26th, Tuesday. Went to tea at the manor. Dust sheets still in the Chinese drawing room. We're thinking of calling it the Japanese drawing room. Nobody will know the difference. Of course they will, Mama. Nonsense, Sylvia. Nobody in Derbyshire could tell one from the other. And everything Japanese is very communal foe nowadays. Darling, Mama, nobody in Derbyshire will know that either, so what is the point? Do please sit down, all of you. Sylvia, dear, ring for tea. Right, dear. Yes. Now come and sit by me, Vicar. Thank you. Sylvia and I <coughs> wish to ask you a Come along, young Beatrice. Over. You and I will have a pair at the stable, shall we, before tea arrives? Are you coming, Basil? Mm -hmm. uh, this, by the way, is the girl who likes horses. Vast, great girl, isn't she? Please. Uh, what a good strong pair of hands on her, too. I wonder if she could manage one of the hunters. What do you think, eh? And this beautiful fellow, this is Bucephalus. <laughs> is he very fierce? Uh, a bit nervy, but not fierce. He looks awfully fierce. You don't really like horses at all, do you? I, I, I don't know anything about them. I, I think they're very beautiful. Uh, at a distance. You're right. They are beautiful. I have a statuette in my room. A bronze. I think I never saw anything so beautiful in my life. It's of a boy on horseback. You can feel the power of his thigh muscles. Oh, it's an exquisite thing. Why, I wonder, did you tell my father that you liked horses? I didn't. 
He seemed to think that I must like them. <laughs> yes, of course, he would. You mustn't mind if he appears to be abominably rude. You should hear what he has to say about me. He considers an interest in the arts to be a feminine, trivial characteristic. Tell me, are, are you fond of paintings, Beatrice? Oh, I've never seen any, except for the print of the light of the world in Father's study. I don't like that. I don't like his face. Oh, you're so right. Sentimental trivialization. You must have natural taste. I, too, have an antipathy towards the pre-Raphaelites. I should very much like to show you some of the paintings which my more enlightened ancestors have collected. I'm making You're a collection. Still there? I promise I won't let him put you on a horse. Oh, thank you. Come along, come along. They're all waiting for us. Come and have tea. You are all ready, then? Yes. And if your father absolutely refuses, then I shall come anyway, if Lady Mary will have me. Oh, yes. She considers it quite reprehensible that you should molder away here. Her words, not mine. Oh, uh, do you smoke? Good gracious, no. Not in public. Do you? Naturally. Excuse me. It must all seem so simple to you. It is. But I can't help being nervous. If your father agrees to your coming, then there will be no problem until you fail to return home in August. If, on the other hand, he refuses his permission, then the inevitable battles will have to be fought sooner rather than later. Have you any money? I have three pounds, seventeen shillings, and fourpence, three farthings. Hannah Kenny started the whole London campaign with less. Another cup of tea, Florence? No, thank you, Lady Mary. How about you, Vicar? Can I tempt you to another cup? Thank you. So, you see, it would be possible, would it not, for Florence... I think Mother is winning. Sylvia, your father is obviously susceptible to flattery. I feel I ought to tell you that I have no real commitment to anything but getting away from home. I have to get away. Yes, of course. I think it's splendid of you. But you see, ultimately, that is what the suffrage movement is all about. Are you two still whispering in that corner? Sylvia! You've monopolised Florence all the afternoon. We've been discussing the suffragette movement, Mama. Sylvia. Oh, my dear, I should have known. I begin to wonder, Sylvia, whether you have any other topic of conversation. Did you know, Vicar, that my daughter is a militant suffragette? I most certainly did not. Ah, I can see that you don't approve. I don't, Lady Mary. I admit I am surprised that... You and Sir Henry allow your Henry, daughter... Henry, did you hear that? What? What's that? I'm afraid the vicar disapproves of us, no, Henry. No, 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 you, 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 you misunderstand me. I, I expressed myself badly. No, it, it is the movement itself. Those dreadful, mannish, pancast women of which I disapprove. On any more personal level, I would not presume... To come to this thy presence, O merciful Lord, trusting in my own righteousness, for I have sinned against thy holy law and am no more worthy to be called thy son. A daughter, have mercy upon these my misdoings. Are you in bed yet, Miss Beatrice? No, Annie. Then put your dressing gown on, there's a good girl, and you slip down to your father's study. Miss Florence is already there. He wants to talk to both you girls. Come in, Beatrice. Sit down. Next to your sister. Beatrice, did you talk to Sylvia Cardell at all this afternoon? No, Father. Not at all? No. Uh, um, I, I said things like, how do you do, and, and goodbye. Yes, so I would assume. Try not to be stupid, Beatrice. What I am trying to ascertain is whether you held any prolonged conversation with her. No. Did you know that she is what is called a suffragette? No. But you, Florence, did you know? Yes, Father. And have been corresponding with her on the subject of the suffragette movement since Christmas? Yes. I see. And it never occurred to you, Florence, at any time to discuss the subject of female suffrage with me? I didn't discuss it with you because I knew that you would disapprove... I like Sylvia very much. I admire her. You admire a young girl who speaks to her mother as if they were contemporaries? 
who blatantly smoke cigarettes without even the courtesy to ask the assembly whether it objects, and who cuts and frizzes her hair in that extraordinary coiffure. I cannot approve your judgment, Florence. I know she behaves rather oddly sometimes, but underneath, she's really a very clever person. By the very use of that word clever, in connection with Miss Cardale, you further condemn her and what she purports to stand for. Cleverness is a very facile attribute based on what I can only suppose is a low form of animal cunning. I knew you'd disapprove. I knew exactly what you'd say. Then I'm happy not to have disappointed you. But I would like an opportunity to explain my attitude. Of course, and I shall be most interested to hear what you have to say. When, perhaps, you have become more rational. But I'm In the not meantime, e I must ask you both to terminate all communication with Miss Cardale. You, Florence, will cease to correspond with her and will drop your friendship forthwith. Is that understood? Yes, Father. Florence. No, Father. It is not understood. I beg your pardon. I do not acknowledge any understanding between us on this matter. Then let me rephrase my requirements. You can order me to stop writing to Sylvia. You can order me not to speak to her or see her again. But I don't see how you can enforce your orders. Beatrice, I think that you had better go to bed. I don't suppose you intend to beat me and you can hardly lock me up. Let me remind you that I should be quite within my rights if I chose to do either of those things or both. However, we are, I should hope, a little more civilised than our forefathers. Then I wonder how you intend to prevent me from doing as I choose. Go to bed, Beatrice. You know that the Cardales have invited me to stay with them in London for a few weeks. And you must realise, my dear Florence, I am surprised that you should even mention the subject under the circumstances, that I cannot possibly allow you to accept their invitation. I have already accepted. I have decided to go. It is not for you to decide. It is not for you to make decisions. Your duty is to obey. I leave tomorrow. I think not. Please, Father. I want to go so much. Oh, my dear child, my dear girl, believe me. A father's duty is a particularly painful one, but I believe that I should be failing in it if I allowed you to come under unnatural and harmful influences. I have a moral and legal duty towards you. What else can I do but very regretfully forbid you to go? But I want to go. I must. You don't understand. I want to go. Want? How are you to know what you want? The blind will. I'm sorry, Florence, the answer is no. And suppose I disobey you? I think that you will not. Beatrice, will you please go to bed? Now! <laughs> Close the door behind you. without being seen. You'll have to lend me all your money. Where are you going? To London. I'm going to the Cardales exactly as planned. Almost exactly as planned. And I've no intention of ever coming back if I can help it. I shall need all Ivo's money, too. I don't think he's got any. Don't be silly. He's got all his birthday money. Please, Flo. You can't just leave me. You'll be so angry. What shall I do? If I stay here, B, I shall crumble uselessly away. Nothing will change. Unless it gets worse. When you're older, you must get away too. You have to be selfish, B. It's not easy. And selfishness is ground into us from birth, but it does no good to anyone. Can I have your travelling bag as well? B, I'm going now. I daren't wait. I don't want to be seen. I'll write to you. I'll write as often as I can. It'll be all right. I'll make it all right. I'm sorry that I have to leave you, Bee, but one day when it's your turn, she'll have a little house together and no one will bother us again. 
Keep an eye on Ivo. Goodbye. I never heard her go in the morning. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> You brushed your hair this morning, Beatrice? Yes. Indeed. Uh, am I to infer that as some sort of early morning exercise will have taken up the pursuit of climbing backwards through hedges? Where is your sister? She is more than five minutes late for breakfast. She has left you a note. Left? Left me a note? Then she is out? No. I... Where is she? Where, where, where is she gone? Where is this note? Do you know anything about this, Ivor? No. Except that she took all my money. I had nearly five pounds. She took all of it. Even my collection of farthings. I see. And did Florence take all your money too, Beatrice? Yes. And has presumably gone to London. Yes. Yes, it is all clear to me. I have been disobeyed. No, thank you, Beatrice. I have no desire to read this note of hers. You may throw it away. Until your sister returns, I desire no communication with her. Doubtless you may expect the return of the prodigal daughter as soon as she has spent all the money which she has stolen. I think we may trust in the efficacy of economic pressures policy of laissez-faire generally brings about the required result. Stop playing with that miserable piece of bread, Beatrice, and eat it! Crikey! Don't you want that bread? No. You've gone a horrible white colour. Horribler than usual. Where's Flo gone? To London. How long is she going to be away? I don't know. Perhaps forever. Oh, good! Oh, double good! Double, treble good! Ivo! Well, it is good. I'm glad she's gone. She's always trying to hurt me. I don't know why. I'm the only person who's any good, I suppose. You and Edward are too drippy. You go white and cry and things. I'm jolly glad she's gone. I hope she never comes back. Ever. Father's walking down the drive. What do you think he's going to do? He's walking very fast. Do you think he'll go to London and fetch her back? He won't do anything that might make him look a fool. No. Look at him. He's in a foul temper. Thank God I go back to school on Monday. When you go back to school on Monday, I shall be here all on my own. With Father. Every weekend. Every evening. For weeks. April the 29th. I've been too busy to write. There is a lot to do. I have to help Annie. Nothing has happened. We haven't heard from Flo. Father won't talk about her. I walk about on tiptoe and try not to be noticed. We are to say in the village that she is visiting friends. I have been thinking about... Beatrice? Oh, yes. Oh, oh I'm sorry. What is that? What are you writing? Th this, th this is some schoolwork. Ah, uh, yes, schoolwork. Yes, Beatrice, I, <clears throat> I've been wondering whether there is any point in your returning to school next week. I am sure that you can use your time more valuably here. I have written to Miss Bennett Price explaining the circumstances and informing her of my decision. You mean that I... I've got to leave school. The woman charges exorbitant fees, and for what? I can see no particular advantage in your continuing your education. The house is full of books, which you may read, if you so wish. But gracious Beatrice, you are 16 years old. It's time that you undertook some of your responsibilities, both in the house and as my daughter in the parish. Which reminds me, I came to ask you if you would do something about the dead daffodils in the altar vases. In so simple and so brief a fashion, one's life can be turned upside down. I was... Uh, I ran to the church 
to deal with the daffodils. Oh, most gracious Lord and Father, turn not thy countenance from me. Standing there at the altar, underneath the glass Christ in the east window, mumbling my incessant prayers to a God who... who... God the Father, the Almighty... I got into such a muddle. His face, Father's face, the humble and humiliated Christ above me, offering the pattern. Well, if there was a God, and oh, I did not dare doubt it, evidence of his existence was everywhere in those days, then he could have nothing but contempt for me, daughter of Eve, sinner, dirty, somehow the source of sin. Of course he would turn his countenance from me to hide his laughter. What are you doing? Shush! Ugh, what a stink! I vote. Father has just told me that I've, I've got to leave school. Why do their stems go slimy? Oh, they do stink. What am I going to do? Crikey, I don't know. What about? About school. I don't want to leave, but he's already sent a letter to Miss Bennett Price. I should be bloody thankful if I were you. I wish I could leave school. But I don't want to. I think what it'll mean. It's a pretty silly school anyway. You can do exactly what you like all day now. You'll be absolutely free. Free? Do you believe in God, Ivo? No. Not even a little bit? Well, a little bit, yes. I wish I didn't. But Harold Preston and I are rationalists. Ivo, do you... Do you believe in human sacrifice? Perhaps I mean self-sacrifice, but... But that suggests that it's voluntary. You see, if you believe in God and in Jesus and all that, then you have to believe in sacrifice because it's part of the pattern. Oh. Flo said you have to be selfish. But if you are Oh, by chosen, the way, did you want to see our dissected rabbit? If you are chosen, do you have to submit? B. Let this cup pass from my lips, please. Do you want to? No. I don't know why girls are so feeble. I just thought it might interest you. It might cheer you up. Oh, not now. Later. It won't wait. It smells vile already. Wish I could get hold of some preserving fluid. I wish Flo hadn't taken all my money. Flo! I write to Flo. She'll know what to do. What did she say in her letter? What letter? The one from Flo. She hasn't written to me yet. Yes, she has. Then where is it? I don't know. If you haven't got it, it's probably still on the dresser in the hall. But I did not remember seeing any letter. I ground some fresh flowers into a vase and carefully wrapped the decomposing daffodils in a sheet of newspaper before running across to the house. There were no letters on the hall dresser. Beatrice, was that you who came bursting into the house, leaving the front door wide open? When are you going to acquire a mode of behaviour befitting your sex? And why are you clutching that newspaper and... What on earth is that smell? Where's the letter? I want the letter. There was a letter from Flo to me. There was. Well, then where is it? I want it. I burnt it. I do not wish you to receive letters from your sister while she persists in her disobedience. I do not wish you to become infected with her ideas. You burnt it? Yes. It was my duty. What did she say? Is she well? My dear Beatrice, I did not open the letter. It was, as you pointed out, addressed to you. It went unopened and unread into the kitchen stove. Well, run along and dispose of it and a little parcel. You'd, you'd better change your dress. Or did you wish to say something? No? Very well, then. Go and tidy yourself. How could I tidy myself? I never really knew how I was as I was. So I lay on my bed and wrote. Dear Flo, Father burnt your letter. So I suggest you send all future letters care of the post office and I will collect them. I don't know what to do. You must help me. It's about school. And there, every day lying on my bed, I wrote my diary. 
Ah, oh, bleak little entries. May the 3rd. This would have been the first day of term. Ivo has gone back. It's very lonely. After lunch, to post office, as usual. Nothing. The king is ill. May the 7th. I have drawn a black frame round yesterday's date because the king died. May the 11th. After lunch, as usual, to post office. Mr. Preston said the Edwardian age has drawn to its close. Oh, very true. Very true. Change and decay. I'm ever so sorry, Miss Beatrice. There's nothing for you. Oh, well... Maybe tomorrow, eh? Yes. <laughs> if I didn't know you so well, Miss Beatrice, I I'd think you were expecting a love letter. <laughs> <laughs> Take the notice of Mrs. Preston. She reads too much. How's Master Ico? Back at prep school. You'll miss him. Oh, what I don't miss is him, that's for sure. Yeah. Lost without him. Yes. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, dear. Uh, hope your father's keeping well. Beatrice? Beatrice Hardy? Can I give you a lift? You appear to be in a hurry. Oh, Mr. Cardale! Basil, please. Come on, climb in. I shall neither kidnap you nor assault you. There. Let me put the rug over your knees. All right, Bilby. Are you warm enough? Yes, thank you. Meeting you like this is extremely fortuitous. You're exactly the person I most wish to see. I have a letter for you. From Flo? From Flo. I was told to deliver it into your hands and into your hands alone. So, hold out your hands. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, how, how is Flo? She was exceptionally well when I left this morning. Why, why don't you read her letter? Or, or would you rather wait until you're alone? If you don't mind. Not at all. What are you doing? I'm hiding it down my boot. Gracious. Tell me, did you generally keep your private correspondence in your boots? I didn't want Father to see it. He burnt the last letter. <laughs> did he? Well, I don't suppose he's taken Flo's flight to London particularly well. Not at all well. No. Well, you can understand that. He's a Victorian. He believes in the divine right of the paedophilias. And why not? Mr. Cardale! Basil. Oh, yes. If I put myself in his position for a moment, I can well appreciate how badly it appears that my mother and sister have behaved. Would it be? Could, could you please stop the car? I think I ought to walk from here. Let me at least take you through the village. Oh, no. No, thank you. Stop here, would you, Bilby? People might see there's so much gossip. And you're afraid your father might hear of it? I, I Is do... all this really necessary? I don't want to make him angry. I don't like it when he's angry. He... Oh, I don't know the word. He oppresses me. I, I am sore oppressed. You are what? I, I, I would like to please him, but I can't. I, I try to be... to propitiate him. Would you like to telephone, Florence? You could come up to the manor and use our phone. Could I? Of course you could. When would you like to come? Tomorrow? Tomorrow afternoon? I, I usually go for a walk in the afternoon. May I really telephone? Of course. May the 12th. After lunch, walked to the manor. Phoned Flo. Could hear her voice, very odd and scratchy sounding, but perfectly clear. Can you hear me, Bee? You sound scratchy. So do you. You got my letter this time? Yes. I'm so sorry about this school business. What a blow. Yes. Still, it was rather a stuffy, old-fashioned sort of place. I liked it. Well, I don't know what I can do, Bee. I've written to Edward. He might have some influence with Father. Do you think so? Well, certainly more than I have. Is it all absolutely frightful at home? Yes. And here I am having a perfectly brilliant time. Are you still there? Yes. Look, send me your letters via Basil. He's going to be up and down all summer. It'll be safer if you can send them with him, and I will too. He burnt your 
your last letter, Flo. So you said. Poor father. Is he very angry, then? Yes. Hurt pride. Oh, do you think so? Well, he doesn't own us, for heaven's sake. I, I think he does. Yes, I think he does, in, in law. Well, I won't be owned. I refuse to belong to anyone, legally or any other way. Sometimes I think his anger will burn me up. I think he owns me. The Lord knoweth them. I can't that hear are a his word, own. darling. There are mighty rushing wind noises down the line. We shall have to stop. Please come home, Flo. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. Oh, love to Annie. Goodbye, Flo. Finished? Yes, thank you. Jolly good. Well, now, would you like some tea? Tea? Oh, oh, no, no, I have to be back for tea. I have tea with Father. But you don't have to go yet, surely. Come and see the pictures I've been hanging in the long gallery. I'd like to show them to you. I long to show them to someone who is not obsessed either with politics or horseflesh. My family are entirely without taste. But you know, among the junk amassed by my ancestors, there is some absolutely marvellous stuff. I listen to him in such an admiring, such an ignorant silence, while he talked of the great passion of his life. One of the great passions. I misinterpreted it all. I thought... <laughs> he was grateful, I suppose, for an interested audience. Any audience. But I thought... And these two I found tied up in an old sheet in the attic. I'm taking them to London with me tomorrow to get them cleaned. You, you're going back to London tomorrow? I could take a letter back with me, if you like. I shall be catching the 11.15 tomorrow morning. Will you come and see me off? You could bring the letter then. No, the trouble is, it, it's very difficult. I, I, I don't think I could get out in the morning. I really do find it very hard to believe that your father is quite the ogre you make him out to be. Oh, no, no, he's not an ogre. Not at all. You don't understand. It's me. You're certainly not an ogre. No, no, but it, it, it's my fault. What is? Well, he, he makes me feel it's my fault. It, it's the effect I have on him. You are late. But it's only ten to four. I ran all the way. So it would appear. However, it is, in fact, seven minutes to four. Annie's mother has had what Annie describes as a bad turn. It will mean that Annie will have to reduce the number of hours she gives us. What a blessing it is that you have left school. Yes. An immense blessing. It's amazing how things work out for the best. God works in a mysterious way. Yes, very mysterious such an occasion gives added weight to the phrase, God knows. What do you mean? By what? By very mysterious. I was agreeing with you. You said it very oddly. Very mysterious. You said it oddly. I'll go and put the kettle on. These details of everyday administration can find me at every turn. For example, the cleaning of the church. Beatrice? Yes? Uh, perhaps you could organise the rotor for me for the next three months. Me? Your name is Beatrice, I believe. It was your mother's choice. She was fond of things Italian. I don't think I... I had supposed that you would be glad to help to ease the burden. Then there is the question of Sunday school. Sunday school? Mrs. Veasy has sent to tell me that she is suffering from arthritis in her knee. I was hoping to visit her tomorrow, but then there is the service. But tomorrow morning... Yes, possibly. It will not inconvenience you, will it? You will be fully occupied with your work in the house. I, I wondered, could I perhaps visit her? My dear Beatrice, what a very kind thought. I think that is an excellent idea. I, I could perhaps uh, take her some flowers or some jam, a little present. Good, good. I am delighted, Beatrice. I, I hadn't thought... <laughs> but there, uh, never mind. Oh, excellent.
Oppenhauer said, the fundamental fault in the character of women is that they have no sense of justice. This arises from their deficiency in the power of reasoning and reflection, but is also partly due to the fact that nature has not destined them to be dependent on strength, but on cunning. That is why they are instinctively crafty and have a tendency to lie. Stop the car, Bilby. I'm so sorry to stop you like this. I'm so late. I thought I'd miss you. Come on. Jump in. All right, Bilby. I couldn't get away. I thought I'd never get to the station on time. I've got the letter. Here. And these are some things of flows. And some jam. Oh, and... Ten shillings. Uh, will you give them to her? Yes, of course. Did you say jam? Oh, it's all wrapped up very carefully. Good. W will you be able to manage it all? As long as the jam doesn't leak. It's supposed to be for Mrs. Veasy. I'm supposed to be visiting her now. I did go in for a few minutes on the way here and took her some flowers. It wasn't a complete lie. May I come and see you when I'm next up here? You mean come to the vicarage? I'm not at all afraid of your father, you know. If I'm to be honest, B, I've always thought him slightly absurd. Do you mind my saying that? <laughs> you look as though you expect me to be struck by a thunderbolt. I was wishing that I were able to think him absurd. An absurd anachronist. But I don't think that anybody who is in possession of so much power can be dismissed so lightly. Does he have power? Oh, yes. But perhaps only because you allow him that power. Nobody can be said to possess power unless others are willing to submit to it. The one is useless without the other. Here we are. Three minutes to spare. That bag in a smoking compartment, Bilby. Well, I shall say goodbye then, B. Goodbye. It's customary, you know, for friends to kiss each other goodbye. That's better. Hope to see you again very soon. I'll give your love to Flo. May the 13th. Today, something happened. My first kiss. On my left cheek, near the corner of my mouth. The text for my sermon this morning is taken from the second epistle of the Apostle Paul to Here, the boy Timothy. Near the corner. Nevertheless, of my mouth. the foundation of God standeth sure, Very gently. having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Me. And such a reminder is Beatrice. as necessary for us today as it was nearly 2,000 years ago. Potatoes, please, Beatrice. Thank you. You are not having any? No, thank you. Beatrice, I was talking to young Albert Bealby after matins. Or rather, I overheard him in conversation with the other choir boys. I understand from what he said that uh, Basil Cardale had been at the manor for a few days last week. So I believe... You believe? He came partly on estate business and partly to collect some things for his mother. Ah, so in fact you do not believe you know for certain? Yes. I understand that Albert Bealby's father works up at the stables and that he often acts as their chauffeur. Yes. Yes. You did not tell me that Mr. Cardale had invited you to drive with him and that you had accepted without having had the courtesy to ask me for my permission. Mr. Cardale offered me a lift since I had walked further than I had intended and was in danger of being late for tea. I see. <clears throat> the uh, gravy, please. It was a kind gesture, which I could hardly refuse. Nor could I reasonably be expected to ask your permission before accepting. Thank you. Did he uh, 
Mention your sister. He said that she was well. I see. And that she intends to take up some sort of employment. She is learning stenography. Stenography? What nonsense is this? Understand me, Beatrice, that family has behaved abominably. The Cardales? I suppose they have presumed to pay for her lessons. They are deliberately encouraging her in her foolishness, deliberately undermining my authority. It is possible that Florence will make a great success of stenography. Am I to understand that she intends to support herself by these means? That she has some idea of staying in London? Well, let us see... Florence, of course, is quite incapable of enduring the hours and the conditions. A lot of girls do. Working class girls, perhaps. That is different. It is no doubt an ideal occupation for them. But Florence was born a gentlewoman. It is her good fortune and yours that you were born into the higher levels of society where you are supported and protected and have no need to provide for yourselves. What happier position could there be? Your plate, please. Mr. Cardale asked if he might come to see us when he's next in Hasselwick. I would prefer to have nothing to do with that family. But surely you have no quarrel with Basil. Uh, would it not be both civil and civilised to, well, perhaps to ask him to tea? Will you have apple pie, Father, or rice pudding? May the 21st. Sunday again. It seems to be Sunday more often than it is not. A wet day. It always seems to rain on Sunday. Father complained about the... Grass polish, Beatrice. I notice a small dried residue of it in the eye of the lectern. It is not like you. I rely on you for the efficient execution of the domestic trivia connected both with the house and with the church. These are your provinces. Yes. I cannot be expected to deal with dried brass polish. No, of course not. You look very, very well, Beatrice. You look less, well, you look altogether more. Well, I am glad to see that your life so markedly agrees with you. You look very well, Beatrice, Father said. He meant that I was conforming to his idea of a daughter. Father reinforced in his position and, correspondingly, God in his. Ah. June, July, August, such a summer, every day burning hot, brilliantly sunny. But was it? No. Oh. Of course not. Of course it was not. It was a normal English summer. August the 24th, 1910. Edward came home today for a whole week. I took the dog cart to the station to meet him. He saw Flo when he was in London, where he stayed the night on his way up from Sussex. Ivo is spending the summer with a friend in Devon called Purbright Minibus. Oh. oh, Lord, B. Nothing changes, does it? Everything is exactly as it was. A kind of voluntary suffocation. I can't imagine why I allow myself to be suffocated for form's sake. I thought you came to see me. Oh, yes, I did. Of course I did. But you have changed. I know. I barely recognised you. By the way, I met a friend of yours when I was in London. You know, of course, to whom I refer. Basil. Yes, when I went to see Flo. He was there, at the Clements Inn offices. We had lunch. You're blushing, Bee. I am not. You have seen a great deal of him this summer, I gather. He's very kind, very interesting. I, I like him very much. Yes. Bee, I think you ought to go back to school. School? Oh, I'd forgotten about school. And about your ambitions? Surely you wanted to beat a certain Miss Phyllis something or other at maths. At maths and botany, yes. Would you like to go back to school? Yes. Yes, I would. But it isn't possible. I, I don't think about it anymore. I've discussed this at great length with Flo. 
We're both worried. We both feel that it's very important you should go back to school. I intend to speak to Father about it when a propitious moment arises. My dear Edward, it is hardly for you to interfere. Unless you intend to pay the bills for your sister's education, I can... I cannot see that it is any of your business. I am not sure that you're being entirely fair, Father. Fair? I have always been scrupulously fair. It ill becomes you to accuse me of being unfair. Uh, unfair to Beatrice, Father. I feel it is very important Beatrice should continue her education. To what end? Why, I don't know what to what end. She, she might want to follow a career. She is already doing so. I meant in the world. There is no place for women in the world. Oh, come. Oh, that simply isn't true. You have no idea. Women are breaking into all sorts of professions these days. Breaking in, precisely. You choose your words well. Some unwomanly creatures, I cannot use the epithet that I would wish, may succeed in breaking in. They will soon discover their limitations. But can you imagine Beatrice in such a situation? She has no aggression in her. None at all. Oh, it is my judgment that, as you and Ivo must make your own ways in the world, it is my duty to provide you with an education that will fit you to do so. Beatrice has no further need of school. Indeed, it might only unsettle her. Oh, but surely, while I take your point, you of all people must grant that education is an end in itself. The house is full of books. I think she very much wants to return to school. Edward, what the female of the species thinks she wants and what, in fact, she needs are two different things, as you will learn when you are older. Yes, satisfactions are not to be found in the world of action and ideas, but in the domestic role to which they are biologically fitted. Look at Beatrice herself. Look how she blooms. Look how she blossoms. The last few months quietly running the house and the parish have been the making of her. Your mother was the same. She was full of absurd ideas until she married. She, too, blossomed in domesticity. Mother died. Of tuberculosis, Edward. The house is damp. All you say may very well be true. I, it probably is. But there are other considerations. I wonder if you've noticed how introverted B has become. Introverted? What am I to understand by introverted? She has thrown altogether too much on her own resources. She needs companionship. She needs to mix with other girls of her own age, to have friends, and some sort of amusement in her life. Yes. Yes, I can appreciate that. It must often be lonely for her with, with none of you at home. Well, I shall give the matter my attention. I do not care to be accused of unfairness by my own son. Well, now, tell me all about your reading party. Oh, it went very well, I think. I quite enjoyed it. Oh, by the way, I saw Florence when I was in London. Do you use the word quite in its absolute or in its relative sense? She has had her hair cut off. It rather suits me. I prefer not to discuss Florence. I may say, however, that I had expected her to return before this. I don't think she is prepared to come back. Nonsense. If necessary, I shall go and fetch her. I think she, too, wants to make her own way in life. Then she has no right. What do they want, these women? We give them everything, and yet still they want. It is no satisfying them. It must be controlled. Oh, forgive me, Edward. I'm tired. It is not a subject I wish to pursue. August the 31st. I am alone again. Edward has gone to stay with a friend in York, and we shall not see him until Christmas. Ivo is still in Devon, and Flo still in London. She has her own room now. But I don't mind about being alone, because suddenly everything seems all right. I'm to go back to school this coming term. It's all arranged. But better than this, Basil is coming for the weekend, and Father has suggested we invite him for tea. September the 1st. I went up to the manor after a cold lunch. It's no good. I cannot write about today. B, how lovely to see you. I had begun to think that you weren't coming. I had begun to think the same. I couldn't get away. Poor Annie's nursing her mother. So I had a lot to do this morning, and then the washing up. 
Let me take your hat. Oh. And your coat. Thank you. That will be for you. For me? Flo, she said she'd ring at about 2.30. You answer it. Hello? Who's that? Is that you, Flo? Me? Yes. Oh, good. How are you? Very well, thank you. And you? Me, darling. I want to talk to you very seriously. Is Basil there? Oh, do you want to speak to him? I, I can call him. No, no. I just wondered whether he was within hearing distance. Well, I, I don't think so. Good. Now, listen, B. It's about... Well, Edward and I have been rather worried. Of course, probably now that you're going back to school... It's... Next term. I'm going to work very hard, Flo. Only Edward said you'd grown up so much and seemed to have forgotten all about school. What I'm trying to ask you is how fond you've become of Basil. I would have thought that was my business. Yes, of course it is. Oh, dear. It's just that you and he seem to have become such good friends that we were rather afraid you might... Be, it really would be an awfully good thing if you could involve yourself in schoolwork and make lots of friends. We were rather afraid you might imagine that you were falling in love with him. I am not imagining anything. Because we couldn't bear you to be hurt. Oh. Oh, I, I see... He's engaged to be married already. No. Well, not exactly. He, he has a, a mistress. Good heavens, no. There is no need to laugh at me. Darling, I wasn't laughing at you. It's no good. I shall just have to tell you straight out. Basil is a homosexual. Oh? You don't know what it means, do you? No. It means that he doesn't like women. He likes me? Yes, yes, of course he likes you. He likes you very much. But he can only fall in love with another man. I don't believe you. I'm sorry. Men do tend to like one another more than they like women. Yes, I suppose they do. Most of them want to exclude us from almost everything. I thought he liked me. Oh, he does. I'm sure he does. But you mustn't stop hoping he... He won't. It'll just be friendship. I feel sick. Go back to school. Work hard and forget all about it. You feel betrayed. You should feel that you've been freed. B, are you still there? B. B. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought you'd finished. I have. What's the matter? Are you ill? You you look dreadful. No, I'm going home now. B, please. What is it? Goodbye. At least tell me what is the matter. Nothing is the matter. Where did you put my hat? In the library. All right. If you insist on going, then I'll drive you home. I, I would prefer to walk, thank you. And I would prefer it if you explained to me why you're behaving like this. What's happened, B? Flo told me... Flo told me you were... Th th that you forgotten the word. I see. I feel sick. Well, what she told you is perfectly true. But I cannot help what I feel. I shan't pretend to you that I'm ashamed, B. But I really am very sorry that it has upset you so much. What on earth made Flo feel she had to tell you that? Because I... I she thought I... Please, may I have my hat? You still feeling sick? Yes, a bit. I, I'm sorry that my... That I... That, that it disgusts you. It doesn't disgust me at all. Then I, why... I don't judge you. I, I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about me. I don't like being despised. You don't think that I despise you? Yes. Because of that? Yes. Because I'm not a man. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. I imagine it's something one has to get used to. I, I ought to have got used to it already. I have grown up with it. It's even part of the teaching of the church. I, I can understand why you should prefer men. Anything that is not a manly virtue can safely be relegated to us. All the negative things. I've been brought up with it. 
Of course you prefer men. Who wouldn't? It was stupid of me to think that... But I don't like being despised. I'm sorry, B. It, it never occurred to me that you might think... Well, well, what I am, what I feel, has nothing to do with our friendship. I have truly valued that. What am I to do about your father's invitation to tea tomorrow? Do you still want me to come? It's of no consequence. No consequence whatever. Anyway, I'm going back to school soon. I'm going to try for a scholarship. I shall... I shall have a lot of catching up to do, so I shall be very busy indeed, extremely busy. Would you please fetch my hat now? Schopenhauer said, it is only the man whose intellect is clouded by his sexual instinct who could give that stunted, narrow-shouldered, broad-hipped and short-legged race the name of the fair sex one would be more justified in calling them the unesthetic sex. September the 3rd. Basil came to tea as arranged. A very awkward occasion. I felt very tired. Went to bed early. September the 8th. Busy getting ready for school next week. There is a lot to do. I'm glad to have so much to think about. Take the M down about two inches, but no more. Well, we can move the buttons. <sighs> so that's two new blouses. And you'll have to have some sort of bus bodice so or some stairs oh. and stockings. And where's your school at? Oh, in the wardrobe somewhere. Well, at least that should fit, unless your head's grown. You better go into Derby tomorrow. I'll come in and get the vicar's luncheon all laid out, and you can get the bits you need at Pritchard's. It'll make a nice day out for you. A nice day? Did I have a nice day? I bought, um, what did I buy? I bought a pair of pale violet stays, beautiful, lightly boned and trimmed with lace, highly unsuitable. Ah, oh, such a silly young girl sitting in the train on the journey home. I remember that. Basil Cardale, Basil Cardale. Basil Cardale, sitting in the train, clutching my parcels, I remember that. Planning. What? My brilliant career, scholarships, a degree, a career in... I am Beatrice Hardy. I am nearly 17. On Monday, I shall go back to school and I shall work to become someone of my own. Excuse me, miss. Mind out at way, dear. You're getting out or not? Sorry. Miss Beatrice? Miss Beatrice Hardy? Yes? Uh, give me your parcels, miss. Pony Chop's waiting for you. Doctor sent it. It's the vicar, Miss Beatrice. He's been taken ill. Uh, this way, Miss. Your father has had a stroke, Beatrice. Do you know what that means? Yes. He's in here. Miss Schofield has made up a bed for him. He doesn't cry, Annie. Miss B, such a terrible shock. I didn't well, know Beatrice, what to do. this is a distressing business. Your father has suffered a severe stroke. However, with careful and devoted nursing, he should make a reasonable recovery. I know that I can trust you to make a splendid little nurse. Uh, I go back to school on Monday. I'm afraid any thought of returning to school is quite out of the question. Your father is seriously ill. Yes. Why is he making that noise? Will he die? He has every chance of making a satisfactory recovery. He will get better, then? Well, let's hope so. We shall all be praying for him. I'll see you out, Doctor. No need, no need. I know my way. Do you know what I think, Annie? I think he did it on purpose. Oh, Miss B, that's a wicked thing to say. Your poor father. I don't mean him. 
Every path that opened before me, he consumed with mm. tongues of fire. All I wanted was to go back to school, that was all. It seemed my only chance. I expect he's laughing now, Annie, up there, sitting up there and laughing. At me and you and my mother. All the hundreds and thousands of us making quiet, obedient and loving sacrifices of ourselves. Now you come along and sit down, dear. I don't like to hear you talk like that. <laughs> oh, oh, Annie! There, there. It'll be all right. You see? You'll be better again in no time at all. Who? Who is there? Are you awake? What? Beatrice. What are you trying to say? Who? It's me, Beatrice. Beatrice. Yes. Free. Free. Beatrice. Free. Our Father, which art in heaven. Our Father. No. Please. Please. No. Our Father. Please. No, I've given up prayer. I will not pray to him. Go to sleep. Sleep. Yes. He looks much better, Miss B. Don't you think so? Yes. I rather wish he'd died. Beatrice. October the 12th, 1910. I have not written in this diary for several weeks. I have been too busy and too tired, and there has been nothing to write. Today, Father is going to get out of bed for the first time. He's going to try to walk to the chair by the window. Uh, thank you, Beatrice. <coughs> you have a strong arm, my dear. That will do very well. Let me put the rug over your knees. Can you lift your arm? There. You may, you may tell Annie to bring my tea tray now. Annie is not here. Not here? Her mother is bedridden. She comes only when she can. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, of course. I had forgotten. I find my memory, Beatrice, that day when I was taken ill. Yes. I, I received a letter from Florence that day. It came with the second post. The direction was typewritten. I did not associate the envelope with Florence. I opened it. I believe the shock was... It was a terrible letter, Beatrice. You are surely not implying that Flo's letter was responsible for your stroke. Is there something wrong, Beatrice? I'll get your tea now. You sound very sharp. I have a headache. I'm sorry to hear that. Your mother suffered from headaches. It is a very common complaint, I believe. November the 6th. Father celebrated communion this morning and later attended matins. With the help of a stick, he is able to get about well, but can do little with his hands. A plague of mice in the larder. November the 12th. Father spoke to me about Flo again. I have made the decision, Beatrice. I'm going to London on Monday. I intend to return with Florence. I have allowed the situation to get out of hand, imagining that circumstances would conspire to bring Florence to her senses. You will see that her bed is aired. House is damp at this time of the year. I really don't think that you are well enough yet. It is a very long journey. I will stay overnight and return on Thursday. I... I shall manage well enough with my stick. It'll be a waste of time. She will not come. And why should she? Because she is my daughter, Beatrice. That is why. November the 14th.
Father to London, aired Flo's bed. November the 16th, Father arrived home, alone, as I expected. He was very angry. Our sister Beatrice is nothing better than a whore, a common whore. Forgive me. It is reprehensible of me to use such words in your presence. She would not come. He stood there, my own daughter, brazenly defying me. I ordered her, I reminded her of her sacred duty of obedience, and still she would not come. She has cut her hair off, you know. She looks absurd. Oh, Beatrice, this is a godless age. What will happen to the family, that most sacred of all institutions, if girls are allowed to wander about, if they waste their time and intellect on matters which do not concern them? The whole structure of our society will topple if this deliberate flouting of the laws of God and of man is not brought under control. I am sure the family is a very convenient institution for you, Father. But perhaps it does not suit all of us. I think you should go to bed. Good heavens, Beatrice, bring... what nonsense you talk. It is not a matter of convenience. If you are talking about convenience, then the family is surely an institution perfectly designed to serve your sex, to provide her with occupation and interest. Here's your stick. She may think she has won, but she has not. Let her make her own way. Let us see how far she will be able to go before she discovers how wrong she has been. I look forward, Beatrice. I look forward with some degree of relish to seeing your sister's unnatural and unfeminine arrogance tempered by the world. And he did not have long to wait. Oh, no. November the 21st. Father found a small paragraph in the Times. He read it to me at breakfast. <laughs> listen, listen to this, Beatrice. This will interest you. This morning, three members of the WSPU appeared at Bow Street Magistrate Court, charged with damage to property amounting to the sum of £175. Mrs. Margaret Hayden French, Miss Pamela Huff, and Miss Florence Hardy had used hammers and stones to smash windows in Oxford Street. All three women, having refused to pay their fines, were imprisoned for one month. <laughs> you see, I knew the world would deal with Florence. Let us see how she enjoys her stay in Holloway. <laughs> laughing. Piece of toast in his hand, laughing. Later that day... No, 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 I, I don't want to. But it's all so very clear, so very in my head. Later that day, I went down to the river like David, and I chose several large white stones and I hid them in my basket and then I collected the keys from the hall dresser Is that you Beatrice? Yes. Where are you going? To clean the church Charlie this is not your day. It seems a convenient moment Walking calmly down the aisle, very calm I knew exactly what I was going to do I put the stones carefully on the altar and looked up at the huge stained glass Christ looming over me. He had no right to expect such absurd behavior from me. I threw the stone at him, the biggest one, and another, and another. The noise terrified me. I was trembling. I was waiting for something to happen. Retribution of some sort. Nothing. Silence. 
I remember the undamaged face of Christ stared down at me above the ruins of his body. A frenzy of destruction possessed me. I tore off the altar cloth, stamped the flowers into the carpet, hurled a silver candlestick at the pulpit, and then I took the communion chalice from which every Sunday I drank the blood of Christ and I threw it. I threw it as hard as I could at the glass face. it appeared that neither God nor man was listening. A futile gesture. It was growing dark. I gathered up my dusters and went quietly back to the vicarage to light the lamps and prepare supper. November the 22nd, 1910. Last night, hooligans broke into the church, which I had forgotten to lock after I did the cleaning. They broke the priceless east window and did a great deal of completely pointless damage. Father wept. He is quite broken by it all. I, on the other hand, had a quiet, busy, but highly satisfactory day. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. In God the Father by Valerie Windsor, B as a girl was played by Amanda Murray, and B in her 80s by Gladys Spencer. The Reverend Hardy was played by Anthony Newlands, Flo by Joanna Wake, Ivo by Adam Godley, and Edward by Stephen Malatat. Sir Henry Cardale and the Station Master were played by Geoffrey Banks, Lady Cardale by Rosalind Knight, Basil by Gareth Forward, Sylvia by Linda Gardner, and Annie by Judith Barker. Mrs. Preston and the woman in the station were Paula Tilbrook, and Mr. Preston and the doctor, Russell Dixon. The play was directed in Manchester by Kay Patrick.